I'm going to have to ask you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's meeting. Thank you for being here. I have a few things I need to mention. Um, the, at the risk of embarrassing myself, you know, this meeting we're having now at 5:30 originally was intended to be starting at 5, but one of our members would not would not be able to, would not have been able to make it, so we changed it to 5:30. But yours truly didn't change all the the times here. Um, and police chief interviews on the posting look like they're going to last for 20 minutes. I can assure you that's not the case. Well, we're not going to give short shrift to either the candidates nor to my fellow select board members. However, this would push everything back, for which I apologize. As a practical matter, we don't know how long the interviews would take anyway, so it may not make any difference. But I know there's people here for other items, and uh, you will be waiting longer, and I'm sorry for that. We could postpone that if, if there was a hue and call to do that. But I figured we should just soldier on and hope you'd understand. Now, the other problem we have is unforeseen, and we got word this afternoon that one of our select board members wouldn't be here this evening. So, speaking only for myself, and I would see what the other select board members have to say, I believe we should conduct the interviews as we planned, but I would suggest the this item be carried over to the next to another meeting when we would have any further discussion that's necessary or to conduct a vote to select our next police chief in the town of Westport. And in the meantime, Ms. Boxler uh, could review the deliberations of tonight on the, the YouTube or Vimeo, whatever we call it, and be ready to uh, come to the next meeting. I really don't like the idea of something so important being decided by not the full board. Um, I'm not so much worried about a tie, although that could happen, but there are five members on the select board and this is an important enough uh, undertaking that I think we should all be participating in that in the end. Uh, we don't want to drag our feet, but we do have some time here. The appointment is to be effective, whoever wins, January 7th, 2024. So those are my, my remarks. Um, the last thing I would say for any of you who wish to speak tonight, this is not a public hearing. The open meeting law allows the chair to decide that there would be no public input, but I, I don't like to do that, and we, we always try to encourage people to speak, but I would ask you if you are going to speak tonight, you speak for only two or three minutes. I don't have an egg timer here, but anyway. I do. You do? Okay. Well, that's, that's probably a modern version of an egg timer. I do. Uh, and, and any questions you have, you, you have to direct them through the chair, and then I decide if I'm going to answer the question uh, or have some of the other select board members to answer the question, or sometimes a knowledgeable person in the audience can answer the question. This keeps a little bit of order to, the, to it, and it gives everybody a chance. So if, if you cooperate with me, I will not invoke the, uh, the gag rule, which I really don't like to do anyway. Uh, I do value uh, public opinion, and I do value advice. Okay, so I think we're ready to proceed with, uh, other, by the way, are there any acknowledgments or recognitions from the Board of Selectmen? I don't have any. Okay, and by the way, uh, when it was to be the 6.05 time, the first public hearing request was postponed, so that'll, postponed. that'll give us a little relief there. Okay, well, I hope some of that is clear and it's not too confusing. So the first item is a very important uh, item on the agenda, and I'm honored to be on a select board that will be part of the selection process of the next police chief in the town of Westport. We have two excellent candidates. I'd like to start by acknowledging the uh, screening committee. Some of the members of the screening committee are here tonight, and we did have a screening committee to look at candidates, and I have a letter here. It's not too long. I'm going to read it. It's from Cindy Brown the chair of the Police Search Committee. 
Now, the members of that committee were Richard Smith, retired police chief, Cindy Brown herself, James Hartnett, Al Lees, Manny Soares, and Chief Keith Pelletier. Dear select board members, at the request of the select board, the police chief search committee has been working to find a suitable candidate for the position of police chief. The committee felt that it was important to post the position in-house first to see if there, were, there was interest among the current staff. The committee received two applications from qualified members of the police department, Sergeant Robert Rebello and Detective Sergeant Christopher Dunn. Applications, resumes, and department goals were reviewed by the committee, and both candidates were interviewed on October the 25th, 2023. The committee met again on October 30th, 2023, and discussed the qualifications, interviews, and submittals. The committee believes both candidates are more than qualified for the position. Their education, experience, and professionalism would provide the leadership needed to oversee this department. The committee unanimously recommends both candidates to be considered by the select board for the position of police chief. Sincerely, Cindy Brown, chair of the police chief search committee. So this is good news for the town of Westport. We have two qualified candidates, and we can't go wrong, and that, that's great. But it just makes the job a little harder. That's okay, too. That's why we're here. So we're going to conduct the two interviews. I put Mr. Cri uh, Sergeant Christopher Dunn's name first for one reason only, is because it was alphabetical. I think, what's the fairest thing I can do here? Alphabetical. So I would ask if Sergeant Rebello is here and he objects, then we'll have Mr. Hartnett spin a pen or something. And if it ends up pointing to Mr. Dunn, he goes, Sergeant Dunn, he goes first. But I, I have a feeling this is not an issue. So without further ado, I'd ask Detective Sergeant Christopher Dunn is to join us. Jim, if you see Rebello, generally we put him down the end. Okay, yeah. I don't see him. I don't see him. Yeah, but that's about it. Okay, well, uh, Sergeant Dunn, is it Detective Sergeant Dunn or Sergeant Dunn? What, what Detective Sergeant Officer? Dunn or no. oh, Sergeant Dunn, doesn't matter. Yeah, your pleasure. I'm sure I'll mess it up sooner or later. Well, we're honored to have you here tonight, and we're honored that you and, and enthused about you being interested in the position and um, looking forward to an interview. I don't know how long this will take. I don't know how many questions there are. I only have a few, but others may have more. So uh, welcome aboard. I, I would ask you and also uh, Sergeant Rebello later to, if you want to make a brief opening statement of a couple of minutes, feel free to do so. Otherwise, we'll just go right at the questions. What is your preference? Uh, sure, I'd love to. I'm honored to be here as well. Uh, first off, I would like to thank the board for an opportunity to grant me an interview to this evening. I hope I get to share my vision and goals with our department, for what I see for our department. A brief summary of myself um, as a police officer for 25 years in our town, and 15 of which in a command capacity. I started off like many other officers as a reserve police officer. I then became a full-time police officer. I transferred to the detective unit, which I uh, investigated a multitude of crimes, including murder. Um, this is where I established a partnership and collaboration with fellow local, state, and federal law enforcement officers. Um, after uh, the detective unit, I was promoted to the rank of sergeant, where one of my responsibilities was training. Training is an extremely essential and core responsibility within the police department. It helps mitigate liability. Liability not only for the police officers, but also for the department and the town. While in charge of the training unit, I oversaw the field training officer program, which sets a core standard and criteria for not only reserve police officers, but full-time police officers. I was also in charge of the recruitment program. Um, our department is not immune, our town is not immune with mm -hmm. the lack of uh, police interest in this day and age. During this time, with, along with another supervisor, I cre uh, we went to a web-based application called Police App, which significantly incre increased our applicant pool. Um, also, um, I decided that we should go as a department to a more web-based training application, which um, promotes accountability, but also, uh, and also um, tests the proficiency of officers regarding policies. During this time, um, I was then transferred back to the detective unit, which I oversaw three detectives, uh, the dispatchers, as well as a school resource officer. I was liaison. Um, to, to boards within this town and departments within this town. Uh, due to my skill set, I was asked and I accepted a position with the FBI, 
where I is not where I'm now a task force officer with the uh, FBI's Gang Street, State Street Task Force. Um, it's a great opportunity regarding networking and collaboration again with state, local, and federal officers, but also show I can identify resources that I can bring back to our police department. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in sociology with a concentration in criminology at Bridgewater State College, now Bridgewater State University. Mm -hmm. And I have a master's degree in criminal justice administration from Anna Maria College. Thank you for those opening remarks. Thank you. Just to get uh, get going here, I have sort of a general question. And my modus operandi is questions that are open-ended really to hear the candidates speak and articulate their views. Well, budgets are always on the mind of select board members, sure. more so now than ever. And the Finance Committee and the Select Board a few years ago said we agreed with the Fire Department and the Police Department that we, you don't have enough staff. Mm -hmm. And I think you have the same staff that you had years ago, maybe not even any, anything larger. That's a challenge, and I don't see that changing, sadly, uh, in the near term. Knowing that, uh, how do you deal with that in terms of, like, I guess the question here is how do as the chief get the more levels of productivity or new ways of doing things uh, to still serve the public and yet meet the challenges of today's policing? Sure. So I think um, creativity. Mm -hmm. When I was in charge of the training unit, I, I oversaw a small budget line item for training, which I uh, trained, made sure the officers were trained, not only reserve police officers, but uh, full-time police officers. And one of the things I would do is I, I would send people to free training with the stipulation that they came back and provided me that training. And I in turn could disseminate it, make a document, and craft it to all, all the other departments. So I think creativity is one. Um, in my professional development, I've taken a, uh, I've, I paid for a three-day police budgeting class. Um, you know, every, to me, everything's on the table when it comes to training. I know with Prop 2.5 that did not pass, there's every department's facing significant cuts. So I think we need to be creative with that. Um, I need to, we need to look at our organizational structure within our department. Mm -hmm. Do we need to allocate resources in different areas that you know, could cover overtime? Um, I think I look for, I, I, I've already received a copy of the budget with the turnbacks, as well as um, the expenditure report. I've already sat down with ex finance committee member to talk about uh, ways to, to maximize the budget. Hmm. Um, I'm eager to learn. I'm eager to, to, to learn with um, the FinCon liaison, but also the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen. I mean, it's my goal is to optimize the budget um, while continuing to provide excellent community service to our department. Um, we, are we are short right now. I mean, we're budgeted for 31 officers. We're at 28 hmm. with potential um, with Chief Pelletier leaving, Deputy Chief Bell. And it's not even, um, that's what we see. But well, what we don't know is we have two officers that are uh, military reservists. Mm. You know, mm. with what's going on in this world, they could be deployed at any time. Yeah. Right. We have a younger, uh, a younger police department. People could be starting families. We need to look at the you know, Family Medical Leave Act, how that's going to impact our department. You know, and at the end of the day, um, policing is inherently dangerous. Police officers, unfortunately, get injured. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to realize the structure of our department and how we need to manage it and move it based on what's going on. A related question is, and I'll use the acronym, which most people in this room would not know until I tell you, it's POST, sure. Police Officer Standards and Training. So in December of 2020, Governor Baker signed uh, a new standards for certification of police departments. Um, and when I did the negotiation with the police department and with Mr. J Jim Hartnett, uh, Lieutenant Kudu talked about this at great length and the, the issues that it causes for policing and it's made the job harder. How would you be coping with that as uh, you go forward here? I'm sure you've, you've already been talking about this and thinking about it. Well, we have, but, but the police officer standard sets aside criteria mm -hmm. for police officers. So it's just, it's just adhering to that criteria is what it boils down to. The issue that we have with post is that it, um, it hampers us when it, with, with, with our, how we use our reserve police officers. Mm -hmm. Where now we used to have reserve police officers um, conducting beach patrols down, in, down by the beaches writing parking tickets. Mm -hmm. And that would you know, offset the cost of a, an officer on overtime. Mm -hmm. um, but now with the implementation of post, that severely hampers us mm -hmm. with that, where now we're using a, a full-time police officer to write parking tickets. Mm -hmm. 
But if I could just get back to you for one second about the budget, there's one Please. thing I, I would like to bring up, <clears throat> and that's grants. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think grants are a good way to uh, assist our department. I don't think grants are a way to supplement a line item. I think we need to look forward with grants, and what I mean by that is the future finance and responsibility that could happen with our town with grants, mm. unfunded mandates. Yeah. Um, we recently applied for and saw a body one camera um, grant, which everyone in the Commonwealth was open to and received, but we need to realize the future financial liability that we could have with, with that grant, where it could be a possibly an unfunded mandate, where in five or seven years from now, um, body, the body one camera system isn't compatible with the software. Where now, we're, we're on the hook, so to speak, for the full, full cost of the body one cameras, where we, we're now receiving it at a reduced or zero cost, I believe. Well, good point, thank you. Those are my initial questions, others? John? I have three, but I'll only ask one, and then I'll let my colleagues ask one. So, if you look at the, the department now, can you talk a little bit about what do you think the department is doing really well right now, mm -hmm. and where do you think we have an opportunity to make some changes? I think first off is diversity. Within the 20 officers that we have for our department, we have two female, two minority males. Um, I think we need to continue with that diversity. Um, with, our with our recruitment process, I think it's a great way to, to show that we have diversity within our department, um, especially at the, the base level where the testing level is. Um, especially with the train coming in, I think the demographic should, could change within our town. I think we need to be ahead of that, and we are. Um, I think, for the most part, our town, and we have a good community relationship with our town, and that our town has a vested interest in our, in our department. They, they, they like our department. But with that being said, you know, we're one incident away in our department of, of losing that. And I think we need to build upon our community relationships within our town, not only with, um, not only with the schools, but also with the highway department, um, you know, within, within my document I wrote, you know, within the first 30 days, I think we should have an open house. Mm -hmm. I want our taxpayers to see what, what they're paying for. But on the other end of that, it's a great way for our police officers to interact with our community members to see what's important to them. So I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what the second question was. I, I, it was the, what are we doing really well and where can we may have opportunity to improve? I think opportunity to improve is, 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 is by being a progressive police department. Again, like I said, it's, it's, it's continuing the partnership with the highway department, um, the collaboration with the schools. I think it's a great opportunity with the schools. I, I've been thinking about how we can incorporate possibly um, like a police explorer program within the schools where you know, they, they can have a class, a law enforcement class. We talk about, um, we talk about how we're, we're losing interest with policing. Maybe we can gather that interest with policing at, at the high school level. Um, I think right now, I think this town is in, a, is in an amazing opportunity. We're, we're having a new police chief, a new fire chief. Mm -hmm. I want to have an excellent partnership with the fire chief when it comes to training. I think we should have co-partnership training. Um, we've seen mass shootings lately. I think that's an important thing that we should address with both the police and fire is to, is to, is to have that type of co-training, co-department training. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Steve, Manny, you have any questions? Um, well, here's a direct question for you, Sergeant Dunn. You should the men and women of the department respect you. They look up to you and, and see you as a leader. 1,000%. I'm a transformational leader. What that means is I like to transform our officers, empower them, provide them with the tools to succeed. I, I, I hold my office accountable. I hold myself more accountable. You know, I strive to be the best police department, the best police officer that I can. I've done that through professional development continuous professional development. I think you look at my resume where you see the years alongside some of the courses I've taken. That shows you I continuously try to apply myself within this town. Um, I've taken mid-management level classes, budget classes, command classes, executive level, police chief classes, where the, it's a ba the basic law certification class I took um, was put on by the general counsel of the Mass Police Association, the Chiefs Association. It's bringing back that professional development and bring it back to our community to better, not only better myself, but better our department and better our community. So yes, I absolutely believe that they have my respect. Another question, you touched base briefly on it in the parking tickets. That's one of our biggest headaches in the summer. <coughs> we've got a lot of complaints on it now. Do you have any kind of plan to address the parking? You know, don't forget, we've got little boroughs in town that double sure. the population in the summer. You've got the harbor, the yes. beaches, the point. Um, and there's parking problems. People park anywhere, especially on the hot days, 4th of July week, they want to get there. 
you know, I was on the department. We mm -hmm. used to write two or three books a day Absolutely. back then. Do you have any kind of uh, any kind of ideas uh, addressing the parking issues? I think it's just continued enforcement. I mean, yeah. I think we look at we always have the the routine shift 10, 10 a.m. to four p.m. Right. You know, maybe looking at that. I think the issue with parking that I see is um, one is the, the the cost of the the parking ticket. It's fifty dollars. Unfortunately, I believe that's the state cap. So I don't think we can go above that. Where people out of town will, gen will happily take a ticket and put it in their, their car and, and walk away. Um, I know there's no parking zones. I, we can enforce no parking. However, now you're impacting a potential family when they come off the beach, they, they're, they have no transportation. So I think it's just enforcement, like strict enforcement regarding the tickets and the ticket writing. Um, as you know, Slugman, you know, we've had a harbor patrol, we've had a beach patrol. I mean, you know, again, the issue is with post. Now, we're, now we're playing full-time police officers, the overtime rate, to to enforce the parking situation rather than the part-time police officers. Great, thank you. Man, well, I'm gonna have to change a lot of my questions because you've answered most of them. Okay. So, <laughs> what I'd like to say is, so I, I did have, what traits would you attribute to an excellent police chief? You just mentioned. Many sure. Of them, so. What one trait would you attribute to being an excellent police chief? Humility. I think being a leader is being humble. You know, knowing your strengths, but more importantly, knowing your weaknesses, and surrounding yourself around people with that set of strengths. You know, being humble is being a good listener, an active listener. You know, empowering others. Like I mentioned before, it's it's um, empowering others. It's also making sure others are given the best opportunity to succeed. Um, so I think humility is one. I think I mentioned self-dedication is another one, or professional development is another one. In my experience, my experience within this police force and my, you know, my experience with being a supervisor in, in various capacities and various roles within the department. Yeah. So I said I had three, but one of them was about diversity, so you already talked about that. Um, so when I um, go out in town and talk about police department, there's like kind of two themes of what, I, of what I hear about police department. The first is, why aren't they giving speeding tickets? Because every road and every town, every place, there's speeders, and why aren't they doing anything about that? Um, the second one is that we don't really have any crime here in Westport, and so there's really not all that much for the police officers to do. So I wonder if you can talk about um, you know, what's up with speeding? What can we do with it? But, but really, if you talk about some of the activity that maybe the public doesn't see, um, then maybe it's crime, maybe it's community policing, but what are you seeing the trends that are happening in Westport um, that maybe it's not as low crime as people think, or maybe we do really do need police officers more than some people think? Well, regarding speed, speeding is extremely important. You know, it's, it's, it's like you mentioned, a lot of people bring it up. Um, we, do have, um, we do have capabilities to monitor speed um, where we've done that in the past, where we receive a speeding complaint and we monitor, uh, we place devices out there to see if that's in fact what the cause is or what the issue is. And then we go back to that citizen and sit there and with them and say, yes, always we can see the date, the time when that actually occurs. Um, regarding speeding, it's, it's, it's educational enforcement. It's, it's one of the two. And, and you know, I, I'm a firm believer in, in education. However, there are times that it needs to be enforced. And it's, it's all on how the officer presents himself at the motor vehicle stop with what, what the infraction is. So there are ways that we can, we can do with speeding. You know, we used to have a speed trailer. Um, we can bring that back. Like I said, we have, we have monitoring devices. I think it's with, regarding speeding, it's people voicing their complaints and listening to them and then getting back to them and communicating so they feel as though their, address, their issue is being addressed. Even if there is an issue, I know there's been streets where people have said they're speed or speeding and we go investigate, and it's really not. But if you don't communicate that back to them, they, they think that there's still an issue. Um, regarding crime, I can tell you we have an, uh, an opioid epidemic with, with heroin and oxycodone. Um, we are part of a grant with other communities where officers can be trained to be going out with clinicians to go out, which is no cost to the town. It actually, it actually covers overtime. It actually back, covers back sales over time. And the, the idea is to um, go out and provide a resource with some of the overdoses. So since 2019, we've had approximately 100 overdoses in town. We've had 50 Narcan deployments with 54 people have, have lived saves. So the idea is for the officers to go out who are trained along with a clinician 
and to provide resources to, to, to not only the person, but also to the family. Because more times than not, it's the family who sees, you know, walks in on the person who overdosed. And the idea is to um, prevent the next overdose. I had an opportunity to speak to the manager or the program manager regarding this grant, and they've actually opened it up to behavioral, mental health issues, which is amazing. You know, I was able to look at other towns, and we were right along time. We were right alongside with Somerset, Swansea, which is what we should, Fairhaven. But Swansea had 96 this year, and that was my question: Wow, what's going on in Swansea with the opioid, opioid epidemic? And the response was, No, they're using the mental health now. So now we can broaden that to people who have mental health issues where we can go out and provide proactive services to them and to their family. So yeah, the opioid epidemic is, is one. Um, yeah, we, we, we are a small community right in between two large, larger communities. We have Horse Neck Beach, which attracts people from various par parts of the state. And during the summertime, we are not a quiet community. So we, 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 ha and we have Route 6, we have the, there's a huge catalytic converter issue where people are stealing catalytic converters, mm -hmm. where they steal them from used car lots. You know, there was a, there was a big uh, federal case recently regarding the stolen of, of catalytic converters. It's a big market. So we definitely have a crime, mm -hmm. we definitely have crime in town. That's my, that's be my answer to you. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if, can you maybe talk a little bit about um, what makes you a different kind of candidate from your uh, I don't want to call him an opponent. Your your colleague, sure. your colleague who's also who's also. What is what is it that differentiates you from the other person applying from this position? Well, first off, it's my experience. I've had several years of supervision, which I've talked to you earlier about. I've you know overseeing patrol the patrol unit, um, being the, the detective sergeant for the town, where I oversaw the three detectives, the school resource officer, the court liaison officer, the dispatchers, the public information officer. Um, as well as forming relationships with, with the school department and other committees in town. Um, district attorney's office, the courts. So uh, the other thing is I've negotiated several successor contracts with our town, including arbitration. Um, I was able to resolve um, several issues that officers might have you know, prior to the step one of a grievance procedure. Um, so that's the first. The second is my professional development, which I've talked to, talked to you about. Um, the third is, is my forward thinking that I received, I, I've, I've always had, I've generated it through taking these command classes. Is my forward thinking, strategic planning. Um, like I said in my document, the first 30 days, I want, I want to have an open house. It's, it's evolving from there with the partnerships that I want to uh, maintain and, and, and move up and create upon, and, and as well as the collaboration in town. You know, I, I like the word inclusiveness. I feel as though it needs to be inclusiveness with this, and I think by doing this and by going back to my de our department and showing them our vision and our goals and getting their feedback and getting their input, making them feel valued and create a team effort is gonna do nothing more than, than having us have a pro great progressive police department. Thank you. Any other question? Good, thank you. I had one other question, but it was just answered, and uh, I don't know if Jimmy put these questions together, it's about what are the three activity trends uh, in the last few years about criminal activity? And you've mentioned that just recently. Uh, I have no further questions, uh, Officer Dunn. We appreciate you being here tonight. We wish you the best of luck. May I? I oh, just, yeah, oh, sorry. Please. I'd like to just include one more thing. Yeah, well, yeah. That it, was, it was my goals and my visions was, yes. was accreditation certification or certification accreditation. I believe we need to be certified and credited within our, within our department. Um, you know, the process is long and tedious. We have an accreditation manager. We should have an accreditation, we, you employ accreditation manager, but I want to expand upon that and make that into a vertical working group. Have an officer there, have a sergeant in there to help out with, with the accreditation manager where they feel empowered, they feel part of the process. It is labor intensive. It's a three year process at the very least where you start with a certification process, where you do a self assessment. From there you do what's called a mock assessment where you have officers come in to see where you're good at and where you're deficient at. From there, you move upon to a full assessment where you achieve certification. And then you repeat the process through accreditation. Through certification, it's approximately 178 core standards that need to be uh, from MPAC, Mass Massachusetts Police Accreditation Commission. For accreditation, it's approximately 340. So it is labor intensive, but the benefits to MPAC, one is 
it lowers the premium that we have through Maya, and two is it opens up us to creative grants that we don't currently have. And I can, I can assure you that there, there's numerous communities that are that both are certified and accredited. Do I know exactly what the premium is and the reduction? No, but if there are a lot of communities that are part of it, I would, sure, I would surely think it's, 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 it's a worthwhile endeavor. Well, thank you for that. Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, thank you. And I said a second ago, if you have any questions to us, uh, feel free. I do not. I just want to let you know, I know I bring not only the experience, but also the leadership and the vision for our department. And I, I look forward to hopefully leading our department to the future. Well, Detective Sergeant Dunn, thank you for being here tonight. You've included yourself well. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, could we summon Sergeant Rubella? We need a bigger meeting room. <laughs> Sergeant Rebello, good evening. Good evening. It's How great to have you with us tonight. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for seeking the, the position of Chief of Police, and we're um, excited about your presence here tonight. Absolutely. I'm excited as well, sir. Uh, I'll ask a question or two just to get the ball rolling. By the way, before I do that, and we offered this opportunity for Sergeant Dunn, is if you would like to make an opening statement of a couple of minutes to say anything sure. about it. But it's up to you. Okay. Um, a lifelong resident in the town of Westport. I. I uh, grew up in the house that my father built, right next door to the house that my mother was born in. Um, I went to Westport Public Schools up until high school. I transitioned over to Stang, got my degree from there, went off to St. Joseph's College in Maine, where I earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Science with a minor in Chemistry. I was working in a chemistry lab for a while. I ended up managing the environmental forensics portion of that lab. During that time, I ran for selectman. I was voted in and served three-year term. During that time, I ended up switching careers, going into teaching, and they require you to get your master's degree to teach in Massachusetts, so I had to leave um, the post at Selectman and focus on getting my master's degree, so I did that. I went to UMass Dartmouth, got a master's degree in teaching. During that time, I was working with the police department as a reserve police officer. I was asked if I wanted to go full-time. I said yes. I took that opportunity, went to a full-time police academy in 2013 and graduated from that. Started there as a patrolman, moved to detectives, and during that time I ended up going back for a second master's degree in criminal justice for Anna Maria College. I got my degree in public administration with a concentration in criminal justice, and then was selected to be a sergeant after taking the exam there, so that's where I reside now. Um, I live in the north end of town, my wife and two children. Um, we enjoy being outdoors, skiing and fishing and uh, things like that. That's in a nutshell. Well, thank you for those introductory comments. Sure. I heard you say you were a member of the Board of Selectmen. I was. Then you decided to change careers. Is there a message for us here? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> thank you. Well, just a sort of a, an open-ended question, which I did ask also of uh, Sergeant Dunn. Sure. The budget challenges, we select board types. We were always thinking about that, and uh, we know what we're up against. So the police department, much like the fire department, is probably understaffed by some measure and the job is not getting any easier, how do you deal with that? What, how do you meet the challenges of today's policing, given re tight staff that's probably not going to grow in the near future? Any thoughts on that? Sure. It's a difficult, obviously the two and a half overrides didn't go through, so we're limited in funds. Being a former selectman, I understand what it's like building a budget on the uh, front end, making sure that everybody has adequate resources to do what they need to do. I understand that there are limited funds, and in doing that moving forward, I would look at cross-training individuals, having people have additional training so that way people didn't have to be called in when we could utilize others for that role. Um, I do, I've written, I'm the grant manager for the town of Westport, or for the Westport Police Department rather, and I've written in the last just over two years 
$110,000 worth of grants, um, which help subsidize the budget in both lines for both um, salaries as well as uh, expenses as well. So some of the equipment that we've been able to purchase on grants now require or per alleviate the burden to the budget so that money can now go back to the town. I'm a firm believer in the fact that if money is left over, it should go back to the town uh, to utilize in other budgets where there may be shortfalls. So I wouldn't want to expend all the funds just because they're there. Um, it's kind of like the mantra that the government type has with, oh, it's there, you might as well use it or you're not going to get it next year. And I don't believe that at all. I think it should go back to the town to subsidize other, other um, budget test necessary um, I would uh, I think that would be it budget wise thank you I, I was also curious about what we know today as post the acronym police officer standards in training Correct. and I became more conversant with that uh, when I was involved with police negotiations um, that's got to present some challenges what do you make of that and how, do, how would you be responding to that in order to deal with the requirements of that law in today's environment? We, we have a lot of training that we take uh, here in the Westport Police Department. Every, we have firearms training, uh, a lot of this stuff, the high or the low frequency, high risk type training. We do a lot with Dartmouth Police Department and Freetown Police Department, things of that nature. We work together. We have training over at the former Gidley School that's no longer there, it was the now the new Dartmouth uh, School. Uh, Dartmouth Police Station rather, and we train over there very much with a lot of very experienced individuals. So a lot of the, like I said, high risk things that we need to do, which would affect us at post. All the officers, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, all of the officers of the Force Police Department are phenomenal. They work very diligently, they work very hard in making sure that they do everything by the book. I know that I've developed, and I know that all of you, so I'm just gonna flip this over real quick. All of you have a portfolio that I submitted to yes. you. Yes, thank you. And in that portfolio, what I've done to help move training forward and make sure that we're doing what we need to do to meet accommodations for post. Um, if you flip to sections uh, four in your portfolios, that section there. So when I first became a sergeant, I had spoken with the chief of police and he had mentioned that roll call is supposed to be or should be something that officers get a nugget of information to take back with them. So I designed and came up with this, what I call five slides. It's a training module that I present at every roll call, or 90% of the roll calls that I have. Um, it's some sort of training that allows officers to take away some bit of information. Sometimes it's officer safety, sometimes it's legal updates, things that are gonna get us what we call jammed up. So we don't wanna do anything wrong in the public, and this helps do that. So I always reinforce these types of things, especially with new officers. Um, I work on the midnight shift. Typically that's where the newer officers reside. So we're constantly focusing on what they've been taught in the academy and reinforcing that every day. I tell my officers too, we're going to a scene, it may be the thousandth time we've dealt with it, but it may be the first time that this individual has dealt with it and we need to handle it with kid gloves. I don't condone laughing or joking around at scenes. We're very serious, we take our job seriously and I just constantly reinforce that with all, of, all the people that I work with and they understand that that's the requirement um, when I'm the supervisor. So just making sure that we're responsible to post. Again, there's, they know that the requirements of post mean that you might not be accredited, and if you lose, I'm not accredited, um, certified. If you're not certified or you're, you lose that, you can't be a cop anywhere in the country. Hmm. So they know that there's a dramatic effect to what's going on with them personally and professionally <coughs> if they don't follow the guidelines that are set forth. So, um, and there are, I won't go into all the guidelines, there's four requirements that we have to submit everything to post pretty much. Even the things that we don't submit to post, we need to keep a log of mm. because they want to make sure that there's not some sort of um, series of events that's occurring all the time that would lead an officer to do something inappropriate. So they keep a watchful eye on everyone. So we are constantly, like I said, we constantly train to make sure that we're prepared for that. Thank you. Sure. Others have questions, Shana? Or um, so can you talk a little bit about what you think the Westport Police Department is doing really well right now and where you think we have some opportunities to make some changes? I think what we're doing really well is, like I said before, our training. We, we have a lot of really good training with a lot of really qualified individuals. Um, the, I said, especially with the low frequency, uh, high risk type stuff, we do a lot of training with that. It's constantly reinforced with us. I think that's where we, we really shine. And like I said, 
we do a lot with a little. Everybody that we have that works with us puts in 100% of effort 100% of the time. They're not gonna leave something on the table undone. And uh, like I said, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that the men and women that I work with in the police department are top notch, second to none. And where do you think we could have some opportunities to make some changes when you come in? What I'd really like to do uh, with changes, so I'm the, uh, I'm in charge of the community outreach unit. And I'd like to have a more robust community outreach program. <clears throat> in my screening interview, uh, Chief Smith had stated that um, he was talking about opioid crisis and what we can do to help people in town with that. And truthfully at that question, I didn't know what to do because I had never been involved with something like that. I've reached out to organizations uh, in the area and they've given me some really great advice on how to reach out to individuals and, and bring that here as well. So increasing the community outreach, doing that aspect of it. And I also like to bring back the Explorer program, much like the fire department does. I think that's a huge asset. Mm -hmm. Utilizing those individuals for the community outreach, bringing that diversity and figuring out what it is that we can offer above and beyond what we're offering right now, I think it'd be a huge benefit. And it would also, we have a, there's a problem, but it's not a problem per se. It's more of an issue countrywide hiring individuals and getting qualified candidates for police jobs. So having individuals within the Explorer program, I think would be an asset to us. We can see how they interact with the public, which is key, that's what we do every day, and ensure that they're, um, see what their work ethic's like and try and get them peak interest and see if we can get them transition into a position with the Westport Police Department as a, as a recruit. Thank you. Sure. Gentlemen. The um, respect within the department. Do you feel you're respected among your peers, uh, members of the department? Absolutely, 100%. I have. Um, I was an FTO. I was a detective. I've helped numerous uh, officers think who thought that writing a search warrant was above them, and I take them under my wing. And I was a former teacher, and I like the coaching aspect of it and the teaching aspect of it and bring them in and help them out and show them that it can be done by everybody. And I'm not the type of person that if somebody comes and asks me a question, I'm going to talk bad about them later on and say, can you believe they asked me that question? Um, it's a conversation between them and I, and uh, I keep it between us, and they, they flourish. And I want everyone to be as successful as I've been. I've had a very successful career. I've had a lot of opportunities. I want to give them the opportunity to be successful as well. I think that's important. I use this line when I had interviewed for Sergeant. I also said it during the screening committee. You're only as strong as your weakest link. It's cliche, but I, I believe it. Um, I try and make every link as strong as possible because if they know how to do the job, then I don't have to do it. And they're more comfortable doing the job and they're more apt to want to do more and, and uh, take more advantage of their own uh, careers and advancement. Do you feel you address uh, any issues like that directly, or would you have it go through the ranks? There's definitely a, a, yeah, a rank and file system. You'd have to follow chain of command. I'm a big proponent of that. However, as a chief of police, I think you need to have an open door policy. I think you need to have a close relationship with the people that work with you. Um, I know that Chief Pelletier has helped on numerous occasions, both professionally and personally. And I think that's, that's a huge aspect of being a good chief. Okay. The other question I asked was, um, Summertime, you know, our population doubles. We got different sections of town. Uh, some of our uh, main concerns we hear about in the summertime is, is issues, particularly with parking. Do you have any kind of game plan to try to do a better job of that? We started the CSO program partly in part due to post, um, so the reserve officers are being phased out. So the CSOs, the community service officers, I developed the curriculum to train them, um, and we did a first training with them, and just getting more of them. The cost of CSOs is less than that of a regular police officer, so utilizing them in situations like that would benefit the town in enforcing parking, things of that nature. Do you think there's a problem now? Do you think, we, uh, or you think we're covering it, doing a good job, or we need some help in that department? We need a little bit more coverage. No, I think, I think more coverage would benefit the town. I know beaches tend to get overpopulated in the summer, and everybody wants to share a piece of our beautiful town, and uh, I don't blame them, but um, we need to make sure that that's uh, curtailed. I've also, um, I don't know if that, that was it. How would you plan to measure the performance of individual offices in the department as a whole? Um, we have, we utilize um, yearly reviews and things of that nature. I think uh, doing those more often I would 
also like to survey, and I mentioned this again in my screening committee things, I like to survey the offices that work with me. I like to give them an opportunity to talk about what's good, um, what we're doing well, what we're doing poorly, and something that they would change if they wanted to. I think building uh, rapport with them and increasing morale, I think, would be a great thing. And then moving forward, again, meeting with them on a regular basis and ensuring with them um, that you're as committed to their success as they are of their own success. I think once they see that you're leading by example and they take you seriously, I think that monitoring their progress is something that needs to be done on a regular basis with the first line supervisors, but um, overall, as long with the uh, chief of police as well. What do you think your greatest strength as a chief would be? I think my greatest strength is that I think it's a science thing in me. I'm a very analytical person. I like uh, getting all the answers to all the possible questions that may arise. If a big decision needs to be made, I like to work as a group and get everybody's input. I like to mitigate problems that may arise later on by getting that input initially and making sure that everything's done. I like to dot my I's and cross all my T's. Um, with that being said, however, we work in a police field and sometimes decisions need to be made in a split second. I'm more than capable of doing that. I've been doing that now for quite some time, both in detectives and as a sergeant. Thank you. Uh, sure. mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, when I talk to people around town about police, the two things I hear is there's too much speeding and why aren't they writing speeding tickets? And also, there's not really any crime in Westport. We don't, you know, why do we need more police officers? So I wonder if you can talk about maybe, you know, the, the perception of the speeding and how we might get that um, changed. And then really the perception of what it is that the police force actually does. Is it crimes is it trend, different kind of trends in crime is it more community policing like what is it that the public should know about what a police officer's job is now that might be different than it was you know 10 15 20 years ago i mean writing citations is, is part of the job arresting individuals that commit crime is part of the job crime prevention as well just being in an area and being uh, seen by individuals to slow people down per se speeding and things like that some of the grants that i've written work towards uh, additional patrols, specifically towards distracted driving, uh, click it or ticket, OUI, things of that nature. So we have a litany of patrols that go out looking for those specific things. So officers, while they're working, have other crimes to do or other tasks to take care of. Um, and sometimes that's calls for service. Other times there's a lot of accidents. We've, we're number one, number two in the, in the state for deer strikes. We've been dealing with a lot of those. Um, so it's just, we do we do a lot anybody that thinks that we don't come by the station and they can go for a ride along not and i think that would be a, is a eye-opening thing and i remember when i first got on the board of selectmen and i was able to go on ride alongs i was like wow you guys that you do do a lot like it it seems like we don't do a lot because everything's going well and there's not a lot of crime so you don't hear about a lot of stuff going on when crime does happen we we solve it we've got a really good solvability with our, our crime rate in town um, and we're out there we're proactive we do what we need to do and we do as much as we can do. Again, sometimes it's staffing levels, and we're just ensuring that we have resources that we need to respond to something if that arise, arises. But I think we, we do, like I said, we do a lot with a little. And uh, we do, we are short staffed, like we said before. And um, we're, there's spillover from other areas as well that we need to take care of. But as far as other communities, people come in from other communities and, and there is crime in town and then we, we do take care of it. So we have um, the fortune of having two very strong candidates internally um, competing for this job. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you think differentiates you from the other person, the other candidate that we're looking at. Sure. Um, so every time I've Every time I move forward in a position, I do everything with intentionality. I always want to make sure that I'm prepared for the next step. So moving from patrolman to detective and then to sergeant, I've always ensured that I've had the proper training and seeked help from individuals that were already in that position to know what to expect when I got there. I never wanted to get into a position and not be a productive member of that group. So I've taken the training, like I said, and I think I've done a, a really good job, a phenomenal job, if I can toot my own horn. Um, but I think I've done a really good job in doing that, preparing myself to be a productive member of that group when I got there. Um, I haven't just sat around hoping that that comes, and I've, I've worked diligently to make sure that I'm putting myself in the best position uh, to make myself the strongest candidate to get that job. Is there anything else that you wanted us to know about you that maybe we didn't ask about it today? Mm -hmm. No, I'm just, like I said before, I'm, 
excited about the opportunity. I am 100% committed to the Westport Police Department and more importantly to the town of Westport. I want to work on helping the town with whatever needs they have and focusing on the officers. Again, it's difficult to find officers if you keep them motivated and you keep them have a positive attitude. Uh, work on what they need, setting their goals and providing them the resources they need to accomplish those goals. I think I've earned the trust and respect of all my fellow officers to take on the difficult challenges that this position brings with it while leading the department to success. Thank you. Any other questions? No. It was well done packet too. Jake, yes, sir. If I, Mr. Chair, so I don't think he was here when we talked about the fact that Anne is missing. So I wonder if you could yeah. recap. Yes, thank you for reminding me. And did we cover that with Sergeant he, Well, Dunn? Uh, Sergeant, D Detective Sergeant Dunn was in the room. Yeah, yeah, okay. We obviously have one member who's not here tonight, and sure. it really is our desire. I believe it's our desire, Mr. Seattle otherwise. This is a, a very important decision Absolutely. for the town of Westport and for its select board. And we would feel more comfortable if all five could ultimately vote. Um, Ann Boxler is she's in an airport somewhere, I'm not sure where it is, and couldn't get back today. So the suggestion was to have another meeting, continuation of this meeting. Um, I would, I'm, I'm going to shoot for next Monday night, uh, if that works for, for the five of us. Uh, and then have any residual discussion or maybe if there's some other questions of an interview kind, we could do that and then make our selection. We want to give this thought and, and deliberation, mm -hmm. but it, I think it's really important that all five of us be here. Uh, Anne can review these uh, deliberations this evening on the, the YouTube video, whatever, Vimeo, whatever we call it, and then we'd be prepared to do that. I know it's an extra week and that's uh, bothersome, but it, it, it'll go fast, I hope, that's right. and uh, I hope that's okay with you. And Absolutely. Uh, if I could just one more quick thing. Yeah, I was going to ask you anything else you want to yeah, add? Yeah, just the table of contents. I'm Just go through your packets real quick. I just want to identify some things and just highlight sure. a couple of things just so that way you understand where these are coming from and how they relate to what I presented to you today. So obviously section one is just the stuff that I presented to you at mm -hmm. the application process. Letter two is just all the letter re recommendation. Mm -hmm. Three of the grant award letters, like I said, I had written so far. Uh, that $110,000 worth of grants. The five slides, we went over that. Section five is electronic citation, electronic report writing, or electronic uh, submissions of reports. So those are training modules that I came up with and I went to each um, roll call. I presented that to every roll call on my own time to make sure that, again, these are just training modules that I've developed okay. and come up with just to advance mm -hmm. uh, what we're doing at the Westport Police Department. Section six is a community outreach presentation that I give. I've spoken at the Council on Aging as well as the St. John the Baptist Women's Guild and at the Westport Federal Credit Union annual town meeting, or annual meeting rather. Um, and that's just about talking about scams and what they can do to prevent themselves from being scammed, things of that nature. Um, I've given it multiple times at the Council on Aging at their open house and things like that, and a technology fair that they had last year as well, um, just to prevent people from doing that. Mm -hmm. Section seven is the patch program. All those patches I designed myself, final approval from both Deputy Chief Bell and Chief Pelletier. Um, those are purchased at the department for $15. I, des I designed all the cards that are attached to them as well. Um, they give a little background of what we're doing with the money and things of that nature. The three of those patches, the money stays right in town. So the veterans patch goes to the veterans affairs officer. The LGBTQ patch, all that money goes to the GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance community at the high school. And the Shamrock patch, all the funds from that will go to the Council on Aging. Um, so that's there as well. And in Section 8, just a recruitment flyer, I put that together too. Again, just trying to recruit individuals, and uh, I designed that as well. So. Nicely done. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Any other comments before we finish up? Again, thank you, thank you for being with us tonight. We're honored to have you. Best Likewise. of luck. And we will see you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Were you going to see if there's public input or no? No. No. Okay. Uh, I was. Okay. If somebody came up to say something. Okay. Yeah.
Okay, we know people have been here a while and we want to move along. Uh, Jim, could you, uh, I, think, I think there's a change in the, the first of the public hearings. Yeah, there's a public hearing scheduled for 605 for uh, Luis, Luis Mustad Cadero, owner and manager of LNS Auto Mall, Inc. He's requested that the board grant a continuance to the next meeting. He's working on modifying the lease and working with the police department to see if he can resolve some of the issues. Okay, I would just suggest we say the next regular meeting. Next we have to give a date and time, correct? Because it's today? Yes. So, so so November 20th? Um, 20th? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 605 on the 20th. Okay, so moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We just repeat that in case people didn't hear it at home, the, the date and time. It's the 20th at 605, correct? Mm -hmm. Let's continue. Thank you. Yes. That's for 1052 State Road. Okay. And if you could do, introduce the next uh, hearing topic for us. So we have a uh, license request to transfer a liquor license from ADV Sanford Court DBA Country Liquor and Variety to Ashan Inc. DBA Country Liquor and Variety. Uh, Sarab Patel will be the owner manager. And this is 233 Sanford Road. This is another public hearing. Come right here, sir. Thank you. How are you, Lloyd? Good. Good evening. Good evening. Do you have further introduction or should we just let these guests speak? Let the speaker speak. Please come forth and regarding the item. Thank you. Good evening for the record. My name is Peter Solino. I'm a lawyer at 550 Locust Street in Fall River. I represent the seller uh, in this transaction, ADV, ADV Sanford Corp, who is selling uh, the real estate and business to Mr. Patel. He is your applicant and petitioner. Hello. Uh, my name is Sir Patel. And the uh, corporation that would be taken over is uh, Ishan Realty Trust and um, uh, acquiring the business and the retail uh, commercial property as well. So this is uh, the same location? Same location. Everything and just transferring it to the new ownership? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thomas, questions from... I just want to note, it's, it appears as if all the paperwork is in order and we've had a favorable police recommendation. Is that true? That is correct, yes. Other comments or questions? If I could. Do you have any other stores in the area? In the area? Uh, in Fall River, I do. You don't uh, have any other ones in Westport? Nothing in Westport at the moment. Thank you. <laughs> if there's no other questions, I'll move it. I'll second. second. Motion made and seconded to approve. Um, any further discussion? Uh, this is a public hearing section, so I would entertain any comments from the public if anybody is so inclined. Okay, that's, that's fine as well. So the motion is made and seconded. And, uh, and now I ask for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? None. That would be four in favor. We have one absent tonight. Thank but, you. But uh, the motion carries. Best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good luck. Good Thank luck. you, guys. The next item, we're now under the category of appointments and resignations. This is A, and it's the only one under that category, request from Kathy Lanier to be appointed to the Internet Advisory Committee. Jim? We have a request from uh, Kathy Lanier to be appointed to the Internet Advisory Committee. I will say that um, I worked with her a bit with the master plan update. She was involved with the you know, cable survey, and uh, she was very involved in that, and I recommend approval. Is Ms. Lanier here tonight? No. Okay. So and that's this your committee, yeah? This is my committee. So I'm the chair of the NERIT uh, Advisory Committee, and we welcome um, Ms. Lanier participation. So I'll move. Second. Motion made and seconded. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. The motion carries. Four in favor. None opposed and one absence. Thank you. The next category would be action items. 4A is the request from the Planning Board for the Board of Selectmen comments and recommendations regarding a site plan approval application for property located at 435 Old Harbor Road with a proposed use of an adolescent education 
and housing facility. Uh, Jim, maybe you could give us a little into this. Yeah, so this is currently going before the planning board for site plan approval. Uh, there's no action specifically that this board would take, but the board usually, the planning board usually refers most of their, or all their proposals to the board of selectmen in case they do have any comment. Um, and that's where it is now. Um, it's an adolescent education and housing facility that they're proposing on Old Harbor Road. Um, I know there's quite a bit of neighborhood um, participation or concern with this project. Um, it's really, at this point, I think more of a zoning issue. Uh, they will have to go before the planning board for site plan approval. Uh, they may be exempt from some of the zoning regulation for educational uses, but um, they still meet, need to meet uh, dimensional, regula dimensional regulations, site plan um, requirements, and that's where they are now. Okay. I reiterate that this is, we're not making the decision here. We're simply being asked as the select board if we have any comments. We may or may not. Oftentimes we don't. We let the planning board, Jim was a former member of the planning board and our town planner. Uh, so I just want you to keep that in mind. Um, so with that, uh, before we, I first asked, Select board members, if they have comments, questions, or anything, then we could ask some questions of the audience. I have concerns, but I'd like to see what they have to offer. I see the attorney here. Let's see what they have to say. Sean, sure, man. I, I don't have any need to comment. Okay. Uh, do we have spokespersons representing the various parties here, or would anybody just want to speak randomly? Uh, Nobody. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I understand we have, we have some uh, concerns and emails and whatnot uh, of the uh, property, of budding a little Compton, uh, the zoning and whatnot, so I certainly share their concern. We have had a similar facility in town. Unfortunately, I didn't get a response yet to the number of calls that we've had to go with the police department. Um, the, the name of the place previously was St. Vincent Paul that handled troubled use, if you would. Um, a little bit of different situation. The diocese handles a lot of their issues, but our police still respond. So um, I have concerns in that aspect. Uh, I don't know what else we can offer at this point, uh, but there is concerns. Well, we, we could certainly simply indicate we are concerned, and we believe the planning board should dig in deeply in this and get all the answers necessary. Jim, does this also involve the Zoning Board of Appeals? So there was an appeal filed to the zoning board. I believe the zoning board uh, dismissed it. Normally, they file the appeals after the building permit is issued. There's certain, there's certain um, actions that the building inspector has to take that then can become appealable. Um, I don't know if they were at that step yet. Um, so mm -hmm. this will be a decision by the by the building inspector. If uh, the neighborhood is not happy with the building inspector's decision, they can appeal it to the zoning board. The zoning board will hear it render a decision, and if they're not happy with the zoning board decision, they could appeal it to the courts. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Sorry, sir. Yes, it's come forth. Not 100% accurate. The, the appeal is still underway. Okay. It was, uh, it was my appeal. Oh. And it got continued. The fishing freedom right there for Sorry. Yeah, you stand the microphone. Yeah. It got continued to uh, December 6th. Okay. So it's, it's ongoing, and uh, that's it. Thank you. You have that, Paul? Did he? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Kevin McGough. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGough. Okay. Uh, any other comments from the uh, from the public to help us in our deliberation? I just can I just say something. So I just wanted to just be clear about like the reason I'm not asking a million questions. We don't really have any authority here. The select board doesn't have any authority to approve or not approve or. Um, really anything. It's it's really the zoning and the building inspector and those groups are the ones that have any authority. All we can do is pass on comments to the planning board, which I feel certain there's a healthy crowd here. The planning board is the one that needs to hear their comments. So I welcome your, I, you, you're here if you want to talk about it and, and tell us why we should also send comments to the planning board. I, I'm really open to hearing that. Um, but we just don't have authority or standing right now other than just making the same comments that you would. So that's why there's not a lot of action here. We don't <laughs> normally, I would say on a good 80% of requests like this, we don't make any comments. It's very common for us to not make any comments. 
I'll just make a comment that I have concern about the zoning, yep. the safety, uh, the use, and, and I hope they'll uh, be wise in their consideration of the impact uh, and do some research on a similar facility that was in town um, because there, there's concern all the way around. Um, there's a good amount of response time to the harbor, particularly in the summer. Uh, I'm not going to go into the amount of police we have on the road and some safety concerns, but we need to take that all into effect, in my opinion. Um, I don't want to be responsible for anybody being hurt in there. There seems to be a little bit of a higher um, issue that something could occur. So that's my concern. Zoning, the usage, uh, and the safety in the area. I don't know if the board uh, shares my concerns, but that's something I would move to send to the planning board. I'm happy to just send that along to the planning board. Is that a motion? Yes. A second. Motion made and seconded. I also am in agreement with, the, with those concerns. Um, so I'll just uh, say one uh, last time before we uh, have a vote here. If there's anybody else who wishes to speak, feel free to do so. I see a few hands. Ms. Gump, please identify yourself. Yes, I will. My name, my name is Peter Cirilli, and I'm a, a lawyer, and I live at 12 T Lane, Westport. Mm -hmm. um, I did attend the, uh, the last hearing um, of the zoning board, and I want to make the council aware that um, there is an issue with respect to the letter that um, Ralph Souza issued and how that letter is being used in the process. Um, I don't represent anyone, but I have been following the, the commentary among my neighbors. And I believe that the concerns that we have is not about the merits of this facility um, or the concerns that even the council has voiced here. Mm -hmm. But our concern is that the process be followed, the process be followed, and that uh, there is concern that that process is not being followed by being skirted, mm -hmm. by characterizing something uh, as an educational facility when mm -hmm. it isn't. And the debates of about the facility is something that should take place in front of ultimately in front of the zoning board and that's all the concern that's uh, uh that's all the concerns that i have and i think that that's shared among among the uh, the residents in this community okay thank you sir any other comments please come to the microphone good evening my name is melissa gel i live at 81 old harbor road I really feel that this is the wrong place for this kind of facility um, for a lot of reasons. Number one is in the summertime in the harbor area, if it's a dry summer, a number of wells have gone dry and the well drillers were very busy and there'll be an increase in the number of people who will be at this facility. Uh, there's no public transportation, um, septic system issues, There'll be more people down there and need a bigger septic system. There'll be an increase in traffic on a narrow, winding country road. Um, neighbors are concerned about students leaving this facility, as they once in a while did at St. Vincent's. Um, and there was a woman at the harbor who took in foster children who went out in the neighborhood and created quite a bit of mischief. Um, so neighbors in the area are concerned about those issues. Um, I would think that maybe a big old Victorian in Fall River or New Bedford might be a better place to put a facility like this. Um, and that's, that's basically what I'm thinking. Thank you for those comments, Ms. Jeff. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, that person had her hand up for a little, then I'll, Mr. Corey, after, after this lady, then you may speak. Hi, my name is Maureen Chardon. I live at 326 Old Harbor, about a half a mile from the property. And the comments that have been already said, I, I share. Um, I think there is a little more depth into this 
um, issue around whether it's a treatment facility or an educational facility. The um, applicant's history is with treatment facilities. Most of them have been on the Cape. Uh, they're converted motels. Um, and so they really, this, this history with this organization is treatment facilities. The licensing, are they licensed through the uh, Department of Health or are they licensed through the Department of Education? There really needs to be a little um, uh, uh, trans more transparency and uh, more clarity around those issues. The other issue that was brought up about the um, appropriateness of the site, um, I had teenage boys and um, I have never seen a teenage boy that wants to do any kind of yard work. Um, uh, working on a farm, you know, this is not really what teenage boys are interested in. Um, there are no facilities for them, no sports facilities, no recreational facilities, no basketball courts, no swimming pools, no place for them to work out and gyms and uh, um, it's so isolated and I think that is an environment that is just um, going to cause problems. They have nothing to do there. Husbandry with cats and dogs, I mean, that's not really husbandry. And so I'm worried about their boredom and then what will happen in the hmm. community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Turner. Very Corey, good. sir, good to see you. Very briefly, Brian Corey, here on behalf of um, Ted Canari, who's a direct butter. I just want to bring this back to the real issue. And the real issue is that the letter, which I'd like you to take note, letter that was uh, requesting the determination stated that this was going to be an ed educational facility mm -hmm. with instruction. However, the fine print of that letter stated that under uh, 105 CMR 644 and, and an additional subsection, that it was going to be licensed under the state as only a rehabilitation center for people with drug and addiction issues. I'm not going to get into a not in my backyard argument. However, transparency is important because there's a big difference between the impact of an educational facility and the impact of a rehabilitation facility. That statute, just so this board understands, that section of CMR is empowered by a different statute. And that section of the CMR allows individuals between the ages of 12 and up to 26 years old to be placed at this facility. So it's not a school. And it's being, it was the opinion that was issued by the zoning enforcement officer was issued based on the idea that this was a school. So half a story in this case or half of a question has led to the issuance of what I would say an incorrect answer and that's why I would ask the select board to have town council assist the, the zoning board of appeals in looking at that issue and whether or not the opinion that was initially issued was valid on its face education is allowed Absolutely. However, this no steps have been made to qualify this proposed institution as a school. There has been no curriculum submitted to the school committee for approval. There has been no initial testing done uh, on a public water supply <clears throat> for a commercial kitchen. There are a whole bunch of things here. So notice needs to be given, and I think town council should be involved at this very, very early stage. And I know how town works. You guys authorize the money, tell town council to get involved. So I'd be asking on behalf of the direct abutter of this project to make sure that these rules and these regulations are closely analyzed. Because it's not being licensed as a school. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Can we get Jim's input on that? Jim, do you feel on the board of appeals should have legal at this point? So so town council was at the meeting, town council was involved already, yes. All right, so they're involved in the process. Okay. We've also had the meetings within departmental meetings, Board of Health, Fire Department, Building Inspector, um, just to look at other issues that may be involved in this. So, um, yeah, everything's being looked at. Please come to the microphone and we'll love to hear what you have to say. 
Yes, uh, Tim Rennie, 303 Old Harbor, um, just down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at the meeting the other day at the Board of Appeals, and I just wanted to add to what Peter Sorelli was speaking about. And really, the word variance hasn't come up, but um, I did speak to town council after the, the meeting, too, and with the group, and saying that if <clears throat> there seemed to be a need for, at minimum, some kind of qualification, because what came, came out at the, the Board of Appeals meeting the other day with the um, petitioner, uh, his attorney <coughs> there was, they were making a case, and, and they even in their own words were saying that this was, we do expect, this was more than just, um, we are using this letter effectively, he said, as um, sort of uh, for, towards our case, towards making this uh, already, you know, a little bit, the ball's in our court. It wasn't just this neutral, well, it, it's possibly going to be approved by the board, uh, <clears throat> but it was, they used the word would. And anyway, there's a lot of semantics involved in that, but the key thing was to say, uh, if it even does go ahead with the Zoning Board of Appeals to qualify that letter, to say it, it was not meant to approve you know, all of these other uh, <clears throat> factors, including the rehabilitation facility uh, uh, law and statutes and things. So it was more about the importance of this really coming up to be reviewed publicly and openly and about the merits of such a facility and whether, you know, that, but that it shouldn't be sort of come through the back door and not be mm -hmm. uh, really reviewed by the community and uh, the neighborhood and, and to be more forthright in the pursuit of this uh, approval process. So. Thank you for those comments and we'll certainly incorporate them. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Steve, did your motion include investigating or uh, asking the planning board to consider looking at the letter specifically that these people have mentioned? I know we you talked about I had safety. zoning safety uh, and one other thing that's, that could be covered. Would you consider amending your motion to add in the, um, the history of this letter that they're talking about and the impacts going forward in the process? You understand? Okay, so, so I amend my motion to say that. one thing. And I'll second. With the planning board, the planning board's authority is limited to the site plan review only, so it would be more drainage, parking, and not necessarily the use. Um, that would be more the building inspector and then eventually the zoning board. Right. So, uh, yeah. And I, I do know the planner has been very involved in it and they're looking at different scenarios right. as well as the planning board. We'll make sure, even though it's for planning board, that that gets CC to the building department too, yep. please. And appeals, obviously. Okay, that was a motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? All well, that was same. a motion to change the motion. Okay, well, that's right. right. She, she was in a chair longer than I had. <laughs> all right, so with that motion, we change the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Now we have. Now you have the motion. The so. motion. I was going to say the original motion. I don't know if that's the right term. I didn't want people to think we were cutting off discussion if people still had right. something to say. Right. So we need somebody to make that motion, right? If you just made that motion. Well, we have a motion on the table now. Oh, that, that was the motion modified. Right. All right, so we're going back to the, the There is the, a whole. This is starting to seem like town meeting a little bit. Yes, yes. yes. yeah. Right. All in favor in favor of saying aye? aye? Aye. Any opposed? None, and there's one absentee. Is Attorney Corey out there? Right. He was. Well, we, we have Ready. certainly, we've made the motion. We are going to incorporate many of these comments. We thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate your efforts and your interest in the town of Westport. And, uh, I know the harbor area well. You know, I even hit golf balls over there once in a while, which is another story. But <laughs> and you are welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. But, <laughs> but That's if, you leave, leave. <laughs> if you leave, and I assure some of you will leave, please don't congregate in the hallway and talk. Please go all the way out before you start chatting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney Clark. I appreciate that. Huh? No one ever wants to stay for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> That's all you have to say to clear it up. <laughs> <laughs> Get stock early now, you know. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for being here. Hopefully, we help. So we'll hear about.
something from somebody eventually, correct? <laughs> Just pay attention to the planning board schedule, I would Planning advise. board, okay. Planning board is the place. And okay. ZBA, and zoning. Oh <laughs> Thank you. Even after I asked him not to congregate and talk in the hallway, there's a lot of chatter going on out there. Well, we can have the last person shut Like, you shut the door? Yeah, when you go up, that one can get shut. I say. So what was the appeal of filing? I mean, the playground. Educational, um, they're saying it's up to kids who are not supposed to be able to be rehabilitated. Education will have to have to be the education. I think that is so funny. Like, it doesn't apply to them. Meet the state. Right. So the state. Okay, the next item is probably not of great public interest, but it would be action item B, the approval of the 2024 Board of Selectmen meeting calendar. That's exciting stuff. Exciting. Now, what I did, I think I told you this before, I can just get that. Jim and Paula had looked at the, uh, the schedule and made some recommendations uh, to the best of my recollection and also my notes. It looks like we covered all of that. So it's, you all have the calendar in front of you? I don't have in front of you, but the wording just needs to be flip-flopped on the red, that's all. At least on my copy of yours. The, 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 the opposite, right? Well, it's just April town meeting and May town elections. It's the opposite. Red. April election, May town Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Not a big deal. You got that, Paula? <laughs> I think you did an admirable job yes. of missing Picky, the Monday you. holidays. <laughs> <laughs> More importantly, <clears throat> well, not that that was important. Um, I called attention last time to the fact that in this schedule, just by the way the dates fall in the, in the year, um, we do have, in making some of these changes, like there's one in December of 24, where there are three Mondays, we're not going to have a meeting on the 30th, so that would mean there'd be like three or four weeks until the next meeting, as long as everybody's aware of that. Now, that's not fatal because we could always call a special meeting, we do something remote if we had to appoint somebody or, or whatever. But I just call uh, your attention to that. That's, that's one spot. It actually has an effect on 2025, but one year at a time. Jim, are there any other spots here, or, or Paula, that, that have what I call a hiatus, where we, instead of having a normal two-week... January to February. So January 22nd is when we meet, and the next meeting would be February 12th. So that's three weeks instead of two, instead of February 5th. Anybody have a problem with that? I like it. It misses the holidays there. <laughs> yeah, this, this is, I think, is a good piece of work because we prefer to not meet on Tuesdays of a holiday week. It's just, yeah. I don't know if we're creatures of habit, but we like Monday. Um, so, so if everybody's good with this, we'll, we don't even need to vote. We'll just by consensus, the yeah. this as a calendar for 2024. Any public comments on this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next item is a request to approve, and I'm going to hope I pronounce this, PAR Corporation contract for design work for the intersection of Gifford Road and Route 177. Jim, maybe you can tell us about that. And so we received a $150,000 earmark from uh, Senator Rodericks to look at or for design or construction of the intersection of Gifford Road and Route 177. We did go out, I reached out to three companies. Um, one of them did not get back, another one said they were too busy. Um, and then Power Engineering gave us a, a lump sum quote for $38,000 to do the design work. The design work would include survey of the intersection and redesign of a um, overhead um, blinking light, uh, flashing signal at that intersection. If, if you go by there now, the signals are old. They're, uh, the old yellow pedestal uh, signals on the intersect on the corners of the property. So, uh, with this, we did get some pricing. We've talked to Mass Highway, Mass DOT, and uh, we feel that with the remaining money, we would have enough to construct the overhead signal as well um, once the design is done. This would be done as a permit with Mass DOT as opposed to a, um, a TIP project, transportation improvement project, which can last like four to seven years, so this could hopefully get done within the next year or two. Um, so I would recommend approval of the par, uh, design contract for $38,000. So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. This is contract is in our package. I assume you've all read it. Um, so one well, quick question. Jim, is there any reason they can't throw up one of those flash and stop signs there? That's a lot busier than some of the intersections we have on that. There's a stop sign there now, which I believe there is. I think it's a regular. 
as yeah. I recall. I didn't check. I got to check with Chris and you could. Yeah, if we could find out because more people from out of town go in that area than backwards. Yeah. Okay, what is the pleasure of the committee on this item? Did we move it? We already moved it. Motion made to second further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. It's four in favor. None opposed, Paul, are in one absence. Okay, the next item is request to expend up to $60,000 of perpetual care funds for road improvements at the Beach Grove Cemetery, Jim. Yeah, so Highway Department's going out to bid for the Chapter 90 program, the street work, and uh, they, they received some fairly advantageous bidding as far as paving goes. Um, so we're looking to amend that contract to allow some additional paving within the cemetery. We have some gravel roads there that were originally around some of the sites that hadn't been developed or hadn't been used that much, but over the last year or two, those sites have been used quite a bit, and um, we'd like to pave those roads. It's, it's difficult to maintain. We're getting ruts when it rains. Uh, it's difficult for the people that are, are there for services mm -hmm. um, as well as visiting. Um, I think we have a reasonable price. We have about $270,000 <coughs> in the perpetual care account now. And just looking at it, uh, just interest alone, we're probably in the range of, especially nowadays with the interest going up, probably 60 to about $90,000 a year in interest. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't really be pulling down on the amount. Uh, and that doesn't include the money we put in for um, sale of lots and so forth. So I, I, okay. I think the $60,000 is, is there uh, without depleting the fund. And I think it would be a good use of the money and make some good improvements to the cemetery. I agree. I'll move it. I'll second. Motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? No, I, I agree. It's. Uh, so the contract that we got right now, it's only going to change next year, so yeah. it'll be time to move now. Yeah. Any public comments on this item? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Uh, that's 401. Once again, thank you. The next item is 5A, the Recreation Department. We understand we have some some good news. Yeah. Yes. Um, is it okay if all three of us come up? Sure. Okay. We just have to you figure out your chair. We're going to give a chair that. A chair. A use a friendly chair, we hope. Some of them are like trick chairs. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for having us today. I'm Dana Stewart, the Recreation Director, and with me tonight are Cindy Wilson and Andrea Dunbar. They are both on our Recreation Commission. They came um, in support of our efforts. Um, I first want to just openly thank everyone on our Recreation Commission that's helped and supported our playground improvement project, and that would be Tim Gillespie, our chair, Stacy Silva Botwell, our vice chair, Cindy Wilson and Andrea Dunbar, as I mentioned, Olivia Carrero, Kimberly Lima, and Keith Diaz. Or Diaz, I think he says it's Diaz. Thank you. Um, so we created a presentation tonight um, so that you can get to know what we've been working so hard on, and um, here we go. So we can go to the next slide. So our vision has been to improve our two town playgrounds for all to enjoy. And I'm really thrilled to be able to be here tonight to say we now have enough funding to fully replace the annex playground, yeah. which is the older of the two playgrounds. Um, so that's why we're doing it first. We do have partial funding to replace the Bicentennial playground and we're gonna continue to work on getting more in order to complete that project. So as you can see in the um, slide there, the Annex Playground was built in 1994 and is 29 years old, pushing 30. <laughs> the Bicentennial Playground off Gifford Road was built in 1999 and is 24 years old. If we could, um, just, if we could sure. just clarify, that's when they did the, um, the rebuild or some additions to it. The playground is much older. Just Which like one? The Bicentennial. They were both older. But uh, that's when the improvements were done with 99. That's when they added the uh, I think Jim Long pushed. Skate park? Or yeah. Yes. No, no, the skate park was before that. Okay. But they added a piece of equipment in 99. So just so you know, the playground is older. Is older. That's uh, good to know. I tried to do my due diligence, my but thank you. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. All right. It's been not a ton of information in the history of the playground. Yeah, it was on We've been trying. Years ago. <laughs> um, and the where I got the 90, 1999 was from, I think there's a rock out there that says Bison 2, like okay, 1999. Yeah, yeah. For George. Yep. All right, you can move to the next slide. Thank you. So our need, our town playgrounds are in need of total replacement due to rot, rust, and corrosion. Due to their age and old designs, our current playgrounds are not accessible to those in wheelchairs are not ADA compliant, and we want to solve this prog problem. 
So there's many benefits to having a nice playground in town, and I listed some of them there. Um, economic development can grow for local businesses, and um, the Annex Playground, as you know, is Central Village area. We have a lot of local businesses and restaurants um, that people can go to if they go to a destination type playground and then get hungry and want to go somewhere, or they feel like they need to pick up something at Lee's Market. Um, this destination for families from other communities bringing in tourism. Um, I talk to a lot of parents who say, you know, they know our town playgrounds are not up to par and they go to neighboring communities to go to those other playgrounds. And we want to change that. We want to make people aware that our playgrounds are new and modern and that they should come to us. And playgrounds can improve property values for those that live nearby. They create positive interactions and experiences for children and families. They improve the connectivity between neighborhoods and the community at large. And outdoor play promotes healthy exercise for kids and adults, and often that's lacking in this day and age. Mental health is also improved through increased activity and socialization. And fully accessible playgrounds allow anyone with a disability to have fun. And there were great um, <coughs> strides with our, in, looking at different design plans that, um, and you'll see the one we chose to make sure that this, in place, this playground is inclusive. All right, thank you. So here are some pictures of our current Annex playground. And as you can see from the pictures, we have rotting split wood, we have cracked plastic, we have rusted bolts, corrosion, and broken fencing. Um, we want to change this. I think our town deserves better. Okay. So the progress that we've made so far, um, the biggest one, securing funding to improve our town playgrounds. So we have 350,000 of Community Preservation Committee funding allocated to this project at town meeting, and that happened in May 2023. And we're going to be dividing that amount between both playgrounds. So an average of 175,000 per playground. So that between the annex and the bicentennial. So that left us with still a need to um, gain more funding. And we're so thrilled that we were recently awarded a grant um, from a anonymous foundation. They um, made a specific request that they do want to stay anonymous of $500,000 to the recreation department from this private foundation to use in order to install our new annex playground with their request for any leftover funds to help with the bicentennial playground. So that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, we also have secured playground company designs and quotes. We received four more quotes from different playground companies and we've been working on that for quite some time now. And our recreation committee, along with created a little subcommittee to help, you know, really investigate and delve into different playgrounds in the area. And we went and visited them. We took pictures. We compared what we liked, what we didn't like. And we have chosen the MRC Game Times design for the Annex Playground and would like to install it this spring 2024. So we are currently going to be working on Bicentennial Playground designs this winter. Um, and we've already spoke with MRC Game Time about that, as well as another company, and we're currently coming up with some different ideas. We also secured quotes for demo and prep of the Annex Playground land and fence quotes, and I have those detailed in the budget that I will give you in a packet that I prepared for you today, as well as you'll see it in the slide coming up toward the end of this presentation. But it doesn't require any money from Westport. It's all covered through mm. the funds we've raised. That's yes. amazing. So this is an overview, an aerial view of the playground design. And I wanted to show you this first because um, we're going to be doing rubberized surfacing, which is the modern standard for all playgrounds. Mm. It is safe. It is weather you know, proof, not proof proof, but um, like it resists extreme heat and extreme cold. It does not freeze. Um, and it's, it's um, beautiful. If you ever go to a neighboring playground that has it, you'll see when you walk out, there's a bit of a cushion to it and it's, it's wonderful. And to orient you, main road is on the right hand side of the screen and the annex okay. building is at the top of the screen. Yes, thank you. How's the maintenance on the, these, this kind of technology? Very minimal to right. low yeah. maintenance. Yeah. We do not have to replenish the wood chips every year, yeah. so we don't have don't that cost. Yeah. 
Um, and the with this plan um, does fit into the plot of where the original playground is right mm -hmm. now. So there will be a bit of a grass area around it, which uh, our current maintenance man has been doing a great job of that, mowing the area around the annex, the back of the annex, and the playground. So that will be the only maintenance, which is um, which is not too much. Is this footprint different than the footprint that exists now? So the footprint that exists now has a big sand area that unfortunately has been infested with wasps every summer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we can't use poison to kill the wasps. We tried using like a peppermint oil and it didn't work. Hmm. Um, so we're getting rid of all sand. So we don't have that problem with the new playground. Um, so that whole sand area is incorporated into this. So it looks bigger. Hmm. Okay. Um, so I just want to point out that a lot of care went into the design and the reason you see that blue throughout is it's mimicking the Westport River, which we think is super cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, you can go to the next slide. You're going to draw so, some fish in there or something. <laughs> yeah, so, so we have an overall nautical theme and we've worked with the company to customize many um, aspects of this. We chose the nautical theme obviously because of our location in Westport. Um, is close to the ocean. Um, there's a history of whaling and um, anyway, we just thought it would be fun as well. And um, we tried to stay with very um, pleasing colors, the blues, the whites, the tans and the grays so that it's not super jarring. It doesn't look like a McDonald's jungle gym in the middle of Central Village. We really wanted it to um, be pleasing to the eye. So you can see it mimics a ship with uh, the mimicked wooden panels there. There's portholes for kids to look through. There's so many different areas to climb. As you can see, with the, there's a climbing wall on the left there, as well as these white climbing bars that kids can go up. Um, that slide, that the white slide that you see to the right, that's a sensory slide. It's called a roller ball slide, and there's little roller balls to it. So when kids go down it, they get the sensory input which um, is really fun. And I actually have seen that kind of slide at another playground and like kids line up to go on it. Um, we also have the ship masts that you can see in the middle there, which are a lot of fun. And we made sure um, to add a couple covered areas within the design. So there's a little bit of break of shade for if it's a nice sunny day. All right, you can go to the next slide. So this is another view of it. Um, in total, there are five different slides. And the highest height is eight feet, which is the current height of the tallest one at the annex right now. We didn't want to go too high um, because then if you go to nine, 10, 12 feet, you have to create enclosed um, areas yeah. in yeah. the upper part. Um, so eight feet was a comfortable enough height um, and, and working with the playground company, they recommended. And we really, they had one slide there, but we really wanted the two slides, knowing that children like to race down and, you know, <laughs> race each other. And one is curved and one is straight, so they can have fun going down both experiences. And then you can see to the left, we have the smaller slides for maybe your two to five year old age range. And there we also decided to have two slides so kids could race down together and interact. And we do have ramps throughout, and along those ramps, there's sensory activities for them to do different musical manipulation things and different activities. For Definitely, them to do. lots of sensory panels along the way. And if we'll go to the next slide, um, you can see there's the entrance. It's all a ramp system so that anyone in a wheelchair or with a physical disability can go on it. Uh, we again want to make sure there was as much inclusivity to this design as possible. Um, the panels that Cindy was mentioning, you can kind of see on the left there, those are musical panels. Um, kids press certain bars or manipulate certain things and then certain chimes, come, you know, happen. Um, and then there's all different kinds of other panels along the way. Um, you can see on the right hand side, that is an inclusive seesaw. Um, four kids can go on it and someone from a wheelchair can be transferred onto that seat. And because there's no, you know, arms, um, like, some, like someone from behind can maybe support them if they need support. There's also a middle part where um, a child with a disability or any child can lie down, sit, and be in the middle as well. So potentially like five, maybe even six kids could be on that together and work, again, socially together to mm. make something mm. happen and to play. 
Um, the frog that you see there, kids can climb up it to get to that other level. However, I'm currently talking with the playground company about making it more of an ocean theme animal, such as a lobster or a fish. <laughs> we like the frog, but we thought, oh, you know, it could be fun to keep up with the ocean theme. Um, also, there's monkey bars you can see there, but it's in a circular pattern, which is a little more unique than your typical straight across. And then at the, um, we'll go to the next slide. And I can, yeah, there we go. The bow of the ship um, has some roping there that kids can climb, and then they can also climb the, the, the bow. Um, I hope I'm saying that right, <laughs> of that part that mimics the ship. And the handicap exhibition. Yeah, so the other item on your left there is a um, in-ground, uh, they call it a whirl spinner. <laughs> and um, so kids can go in a wheelchair right on it, um, even someone on crutches. And there's actually a little bench in there too, so someone could sit down for more support. And then someone from the outside can actively twirl it for the kids in the inside. And the, the kids can also stand up in there. When we were looking at different playgrounds, I went to probably about 10 different playgrounds and looked at them hmm. and saw kids in action on them. And they were used by a mix of different hmm. people. They yes. Put a lot of kids on it. <laughs> yes. They could, they could move it themselves or they could be, have people move it. There's going to be a lot of popular items in this playground, I think. <laughs> Um, and so then you can kind of see in the distance, there's a whale. We have a whale. So if we go to the next slide. Oh, nope. other way, I think. Or maybe There's not. one more. There we go. Okay. Right. We have a really cool whale coming out of the ground. So kids can climb on that. They can go under the tail. Um, and I think that's going to be a really interesting feature that's going to set this playground apart from others as well. Um, and you can see the swings. We have a number of swings. Oh, yes, There's a round swing that multiple children can go on at once, handicapped or non-handicapped. We do. We ha currently have a handicap accessible swing that would be in that empty space in the swings behind it. And then we'll have a toddler swing and several regular swings. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, we didn't want to buy another, a new handicap accessible swing because we just got one for our playgrounds this past year. So we're going to utilize that, that one that we already have. Okay, um, so here's our budget. And again, we have all funding to complete this playground. Um, the playground equipment, and in the packet I give you all, you'll see a copy of, a full copy of the playground um, contract. We have not signed anything yet. I want to make sure to come here um, to show everything to you before signing. Um, but uh, 605, 283, and 20 cents is currently um, the amount. That is uh, through MRC Game Time. Then the demo of the old playground and prep of the land, um, we've spoken with uh, AJ Potter and Sons, and that's 13,500. And then the fencing surrounding the playground. Right now, we've secured one qu quote from Highland Fence, which did the fencing around the back of the annex. And we wanna get matching fencing for around the playground. Um, and that was their quote um, with the prevailing wage of 28,800. So, um, after speaking with Jim, we might have to get a couple other quotes for that um, to see. And then signs, we're estimating maybe $1,000 for a nice sign um, that is naming the playground. Um, but I know the highway department does signage too, so we might work with them on that. So the estimated total expenses there, you can see. And then below that, we're using half the funds from CPC and then the donation. And then if it, you want to notice at the bottom, um, we still have a little over $200,000 to use towards funding the Bicentennial Playground. Um, so that's excellent. And we really hope that that will spur local businesses. Um, we're going to be investigating other grants um, and things of that nature. We did talked about maybe applying for Community Preservation Commission application again um, so that we can complete that playground as well in the near future. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, the private foundation specifically said they wanted the grant money used towards the annex playground. Correct. Okay. And they saw the proposal, and this is what they were content wanting us to go forward with. Okay. So no at this point, um, I'd love to pass out the packets for your reference. You can look at them at your leisure and let me know if you have any questions. Um, I believe I sent a digital copy. Okay, between when I sent it today and right before this meeting, we noticed one mistake. 
Um, so I wanted to see if you could just delete that. I can resend it. Um, and I also have the corrected hard copy versions. It named the foundation. The yeah, foundation. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we want to make sure to honor their request, so. Well, this is great. Yeah. This is amazing. I think it'll be exciting. It was oh, yeah. Dartmouth has three or four new playgrounds, and yeah. Noah's Thanks. place yeah. in um, New Bedford was really uh -huh. impressive. And Thank there were a bunch in, in well, Rhode Island that I went and looked at. A couple in Fall River, different places. It was fun to go around and see the kids enjoying yeah. it. And we kind of picked and choose our favorite parts from the different playgrounds. I oh, took pictures. Not so many places sure. to hide to. That's another. Yeah. That's another concern. <laughs> that's another concern. So you can find the kids. So and, um, try yes. perfection fence for another one. They, perfection fence. Yeah, Thank they're you. Out of Mansfield. Wonderful. Okay, so we don't. We're not taking action tonight, right? We, I think we have to. That's but the, later there'll be the contract presented to yeah, us. Your signature. Will. So I, I have they, the, um, the Anonymous Foundation forwarded me um, the contract today uh, for DocuSign signature. I can sign it or Jim, Jim can sign it if you like. Uh, but it is a copy of it with the name redacted is included in your packet. So if you have any questions, you okay. can. And if we so. sign it in the, like next week or two, we can, they can go ahead and order everything and we don't. We can get the current price if we wait, then it's up 3% after the okay. year. Yeah, I, yeah. To go ahead and yeah, do we have to sign this up? Do you sign it? What's, what's the protocol here? I thought the selectman had to sign all these contracts. It's okay if we don't. <laughs> Not all of them, no. We do sign quite a few of them. Um, yeah. The uh, long-term contracts go through the selectman. Uh, some of the short purchase orders do not go through the selectman. Yeah, right. whatever you <coughs> Do is just coordinate that. Okay. You want to authorize it? Well, yeah, I think we need to. You, want, you need authorization here. You that or you, Dick? Whatever one you want, want to fight over. You want to. Well, he's he's we'll more accessible, so he's here yeah. every day. All right, I move that we uh, allow the town administrator to sign off after he reviews the contract. I'll second. Motion made and seconded. This discussion. Does that work for the your committee? Yes, thank you. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. It passes four zero one. Well, thank you. I'm so you are welcome. Um, I just wanted to point out in the packet I gave you, there is an estimated timeline. Um, so we do need to sign off on the um, foundation grant agreement as well as the playground agreement uh, before November 20th. Um, the reason for that is after November 20th, the price goes up. No, all right. <laughs> on the playground. You, know, we'll so, you know, it's, it's a holiday Friday, and you know what else has come up. You yeah. just authorized the man that's here all the time. Yeah, right there. Take it, you don't go on vacation until yeah. you get this signed. Uh, <laughs> you want to line all that up early, too, because I, I've done a couple of them. I did one in Dartmouth, too. The uh, base is going to be a pain. The, the, uh, when they part, the, yes. the, 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 you, want, you need to line all that out up because then they, they bring the other equipment in. Yep. You're also going to might need a storage unit too, so you need to get all of that done. We've so actually, yeah, so okay. I've worked out with the playground company that they are going to store the equipment for us until installation. Right, okay. So. And they're hoping to install at the end of uh, Yeah. Uh, Probably late April. Is that right? So March, April? April is the estimated um, demo. demo of the annex playground and prep of the land. Um, late April, early May is when they will MRC Game Time will probably deliver the equipment and install the playground. They install the playground equipment first, and then they pour the rubberized surfacing after installation. That's the pain. All the after. kids want to play on it. And they don't Correct. Have the want to make sure it's like cordoned <laughs> off. Yeah. And then mid to late May, we're going to be installing the new fencing. And then June is our hope for the grand opening of our new Canix playground. Nice. Right. Very good. Good summer. Right, 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 right time right. for summer. I would just like to add that, um, you know, Dana thanked the commission, but honestly, this project would not have gotten off the ground with the hard work, without the hard work of Dana. And she truly is an asset to our town, and this project is, is very much um, where it is because of all of her hard work. So I just wanted to make it clear, because she thanked us, but it's really, yeah. she's, no, we know. she's, she's the driving you. force. Thank, thank you, you so you. much. It's been my pleasure. Well, thank you. Thank Anytime you. it's good news, we, we want to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Controversial. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Danny, you don't have to come to the Capital Improvements Planning Committee anymore. That's right. That's right. Well, she still needs another playground. <laughs> there is another so playground. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, so noted. <laughs> Thanks all right. Again. Thank you so much for letting us present this. We're very excited about it. Thank you. Thank we are Thank too. You. Good evening. Thank you. Okay, we're going to pass over the next item, the town broadband update for the late 20th, maybe, Jim? Yeah, I can put it on the 20th board. Wishes? 
Maybe that works. Yeah, I mean, I just like to add to let's call it the uh, Internet Advisory Committee update. Yeah, we're going to have a meeting on Thursday, and one of the things we'll talk about is the presentation to the board. Thank you. Okay, the next item, 5C, is uh, the request, uh, I believe this was initiated by Manny, to consider a town public infrastructure engineer or town engineer, whatever it's called. Um, Jim, maybe you can start and Manny can pick up. This was yeah. Manny's request. Well, um, kind of one, one of the other things, like we're, we're going to be looking at all the fees in town, building permit fees and all that stuff. So one of the things that... Uh, we have a major problem with is we have no drainway of licenses or permits or bonding requirements and we're going to need somebody in place to set all this stuff up. Um, I, I would like to probably um, see what's needed to create, say, a um, trying to maybe transform what we need into a, com a commission, an infrastructure commission, or maybe like three commissioners, what we need to do to do that, mm -hmm. that, the, that the engineer could report to. Um, what I'm kind of foreseeing with the engineer is that he can help all the departments. Mm -hmm. um, with a lot of things that we got coming moving forward in the town, um, engineering-wise, all our stormwater issues, our water, sewer, mm -hmm. this PFAS regulations, all that stuff. We need somebody that's understands that um, uh, the existing water main that we have on Route 6 and moving forward with looping into the Macumber and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, somebody that can, can reach out and coordinate with Fall River and all that other stuff. Um, so I, I don't, Jim, I don't know what the procedure is if we're allowed to just create a commission to, that, they, that he could report to. I'd have to check on that then. Got to come up with a position, a contract, they can, and a They could do a committee, um, depending on the type of commission. You know, you might have water commissions for the water line. You could have water and sewer be the same, but that process is a little bit different. I'd have to look to find out exactly. I, I mean, what I'm kind of looking to it. have kind of like a general thing, like, a, like so. He's public infrastructure, which would encompass all the things. You know, like so, highway remains as a you know. He can, he can also assist in highway, but highway can remain as the maintenance that they that they are. You know, I mean, like the Chris coming and saving us and all the things, we, you know, between cutting the grass, snow plowing, you know, the chapter 90 work and all that stuff. Um, just keep highway the way they are and this engineer can help the building department, you know, especially in the, in the permitting end. I, I mean, I'm starting to see some of the, I mean, we are going to review all the permit fees and I'm looking at, kind of what's happened in some of the other towns and it looks like we're slipping through the cracks on some of this stuff and um, like uh, on the, like even like these solar projects tying in and stuff like that it's I really think we need we need to get somebody on board. Yeah. Jim is there any would there be any involvement of the personnel board on this? Actually yes it would it be a personnel to the personnel bylaw so they would be they should be at least See what we had in the past. Highway had an engineer 20 years ago, 25 years ago. To me, I mean, there's no question at some point whether we can do it this year or not. We need an engineer here in town. Um, I think we could still stick around. To possibly it. use the funding, you know, the, the opera money for that that's earmarked for sewer and water. You know, I, I mean, we got we got a consultant working on that, right? You know, with that stuff yep. right now. But if you know, take advantage of that. I'm, I'm sure we could. We, as things move forward and what's happening, we you know, we're looking for our funding sources. I mean, we're gonna need somebody to, to take us into that. I mean, we, we're, we're the water commissioners right now. Mm. So, mm. Um, uh, Jim's got a lot to do. <laughs> so. we, we have a lot of projects, right? Yeah. You, you know, we have Gifford Road, we have yeah. Roundabout, we have water, we have sewer, we have, um, there's other Cable issues. Cable coming from the ocean. <laughs> you know, they, the planning board uses a consultant to oversee a lot of their drainage designs to review that. And, and that consultant is no longer going to be doing that. If you had an in-house engineer that could do that, it would be it'd be helpful. But there's a cost to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've kind of held off in the past. Um, I think the, the permitting and fee schedules and, you know, like using them for going out and doing some inspections on these jobs, I think we have more than enough work. For sure. Yeah, no question. And I, and I think, he, you know, he could definitely assist the building department. Um, kind of 
bring all the permitting stuff together so that well uh, I, one thing that occurs to me is we had another position there's a lot of other departments that are looking for another position so if we go in this direction I'm not questioning its worthiness it seems it's probably overdue but we got to be sure we're going to do this because you're going to have other people showing up saying what about us and what with those police or fire I mean they've been looking for an extra police officer for five years I, I'm just pointing it out and not that you don't need to know this but it's so I'm a tough question so I'm opposed to creating a new position for that very reason we, we if we add a brand new position it's it's not being fiscally responsible. However, I think the position is really needed. And I think we might have an opportunity to use one-time money like the ARPA grants or the free cash or something like that to create more of like a contract position or a temporary position rather than bringing someone on full-time. I think that it would be better if we had a Department of Public Works and that this person might be suited in the Department of Public Works and we have an infrastructure going on there. Um, but I think that, I think our best chance of getting a person in this position is a, not a permanent employee, but some sort of contract or temporary employee so that we can then pay for it with one-time money. So I would, I, I, it's not ideal, but it's gonna be really hard to add a new Department or add a new position in a department, well, especially this is going to be a professional position, so I think it's going to be kind of a higher paying position. Um, but I'd like to make it happen. So if there's a way to make it happen using one time monies for not ongoing operating expenses, I think that's our best chance. So okay. we have a completed sewer and water design down Route 6. Okay, we have issues with permits that have been issued on Route 6 for water. We haven't been able to tie, make any, we haven't made a loop. I didn't say you don't need the position. So, so we need to, we, we need to move like mm -hmm. quick. So also some of the other things that we got coming down the road, we would probably, you know, when you make a, a water connection, when you make some of this, we're talking about this other cable stuff. When you make these connections, there's fees involved. So other towns, when you make, when you make a water tap, it's paid by the inch, you know, I, they, then they have I and I fees and all kinds of other stuff that an engineer is the only one's going to know. The select board doesn't understand that type of stuff. Um, no, I don't. I mean, we still have an outstanding issue with Fall River with our water bills. I mean, I, I, and I know you work hard on that, Jim, but we need somebody that's. We need to get. We need to get. You know, just like the Board of Health has a septic installer's license, we need a drain layer's license in town. They're already doing them without it. I mean, you get, you know, we, we have an issue now with, with, with a property owner who pulled out, a, we pulled out the permit for him and he refuses to do the patch. <coughs> We're gonna be stuck paying for that patch. You know, I mean, procedure wasn't followed. Uh, I mean, we can't kick the, run, the can down the road. We're probably gonna have some water project by next year with this PFAS stuff, and cut stuff coming down. You're gonna, he can work at also as the clerk of the works on the project, making sure that it's installed correctly. I mean, we need somebody now, not. I agree, the fastest way to get somebody is to use one-time money or ARPA money and to hire a contractor rather than an employee. That's the fastest way to get someone in. It's the fastest way to justify in the budget it's maybe not the best long term because you don't have continuity, but that's the fastest way to get that person in here because we're gonna go to town meeting with having to make some significant cuts. I don't think we're gonna be able to add something new unless we can figure out how to use those grant money and that one-time money. Well, I mean, it's kind of like when our project manager, Roger, right? I mean, it's, it's something like that, but, but no, we're not his only job. That's my problem when hiring a contractor. We need somebody dedicated to Westport. We don't need somebody that's, you know, all right, it's like, like our consultants and they're doing 10 jobs. Well, hire right now we have time. more work. Hire two full-time. Hire, hire two full-time people to work on a contract, then you can get them in. I'm just telling you that's the fastest, easiest way to get someone in, is that way. Now, the other commission that you're talking about, I, that I don't know anything about. Well, we're, we're going to have to come up with something because, we're, you know, unless the selectmen want to remain sewer and water commissions, you know, we have a design ready, so what are we gonna just wait until 
you know, we're trying until we get a contract out there. We don't even have, we don't, you know, who's going to pull permits? <coughs> People are going to start coming to town hall. I mean, you're going to have all this stuff coming down the road. They're going to be in the building department. Hey, how do I tie into the sewer? So, I mean, we need to move as quickly yeah, as we I can. Yeah, I see uh, the situation here. It's just hard for us to grab around it nowadays when we don't have enough money for a lot of other things. Well, anyway, so what's the, what's the mission here? Is it to get going for you to, you to you work propose? with? Uh, can you, yeah, what do, you, what do you need? to? I mean, I think maybe we'll, in this next infrastructure oversight committee meeting, maybe we ask Bob what he thinks on what, how we should move forward. No problem, but you're going to have to find out what, you know, what, the, what other communities do, basic fee, uh, salary, all that good stuff, so we can do some kind of proposal. All right. I mean, we all would right. disagree. We needed an engineer. Like I said, they had it 25 years ago, but they just don't stick around. Yeah. It could be tough. All right. We, <laughs> so we'll get something going here, and we'll just report back as, as necessary when time permits, and he'll be here to keep us focused. I'll try. Thank you. Okay, so that, that concludes that uh, item. Next item is the town administrator report. And just a few items. Um, I know I've mentioned this a number of times, but Diamond over at the uh, cemetery is getting close to finishing. Um, they've done a tremendous amount of work over there. They put in a whole new bathroom, break room, they reshingled the outside, they replaced the door with a window, they've uh, upgraded the electrical inside, they upgraded the electrical service outside, uh, they repaired and replaced the hardware on a number of the gates at, on the uh, perimeter of the cemetery and repainted those. Um, we also met with Manny Gatello from Diamond. Uh, he was here last Thursday. Um, and he's considering replacing our table here, uh, mm -hmm. building a new table for the for the board of select. And he's supposed to come up with some preliminary mm -hmm. ideas as to how that would be set up. Um, and hopefully, have that in a couple of weeks. And, wow, and, that's cool. <laughs> we have new cabinets. Yeah, new, new cabinets. We're gonna be spoiled. <laughs> um, I miss the nail slots. I've been looking at them for twenty something years. <laughs> <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, that, that's good news, and they seemed excited about it. It's a nice project for them, and it's, um, it's visible, and it's something they can do for the town. So um, we should get back in hopefully another week or two. Um, Drift Road, Kirby, Brook Bridge. Uh, Power Engineering submitted the 25% design plans to the state, uh, Mass DOT. Um, this contract is being funded by Mass DOT, so they... It's their design. Uh, the, the engineer is working for them, not necessarily working for the town, but I did set up a meeting. I'm meeting with them tomorrow, kind of with uh, Mass DOT and Power Engineering, just to kind of see where this goes from here, to see what type of public input we can get in the process uh, going forward, because I know there's a lot of um, interest from the neighborhood down there along Kirby Brook as to how this is going to be designed. Um, Mass Highway will do some aesthetic improvements, to the design, but um, there's limitations as to what they'll do. So I'd like to find out what those are really are in the process until we get to the 100% design and uh, people are not happy or they are. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we'll have some more information after tomorrow's meeting. Um, budgets, town departments have submitted all their budgets. Uh, just started meeting with departments today. Uh, Paul is gonna set up meetings with the rest of them. Uh, those should be completed by next week. So we are on schedule as far as that goes. The numbers, the um, free cash will be submitted, I think, in the next week or so, uh, hopefully by the end of this week, uh, to the state to be certified. I think we'll have a healthy free cash number. Uh, she's working on the final numbers now, so I have those for you for the next week, next meeting. Um, I think the big thing is um, the, the town side budget. When I say it's it's looking okay. Is I mean, we still we haven't added to any of these budgets in years, right? So we're, we're doing level funded budgets on the expense accounts unless we have a specific need to increase, you know, fuel costs, electrical costs. Mm -hmm. But everything else has been level level funded, and we're just uh, putting in for the contracted raises. Um, but we're close on the number. Um, depending on what we get for state aid, the town side we may be able to uh, squeak by for one more year. Uh, the school side is going to be significantly different. Um, they had 500 some thousand dollars in free cash last year. The early numbers is with the 54, 46%, they're going to be right at the same number they were this year for next year. Um, 
a couple of things we're waiting on. Obviously, state aid isn't, we won't know that for, for months. We'll get some preliminary numbers in January. Chapter 70, which is the education portion of the state aid, went up last year. Um, if that goes up the same increment, um, it'll be a little bit more funding for the school and the town, but um, it's not going to be what they need um, or, or what they, it's not going to be what they need. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a tough year for the school department. It's be tough for us as well, but I, I think mm -hmm. we can squeak by with minimal cuts. And when I say minimal, it's, it's the same cuts we do every year, right? We don't add anything. so. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't look like we're cutting the budget. We are cutting the budget because prices are going up, every yeah. costs are going up, and we're maintaining the same, same cost. So, um, yeah. So we'll wait on the Chapter 70. The state assessments is the other one, and the regional schools, charter schools, and school choice are the other big numbers that we need to wait on. Is there any hope there with uh, the formula that it would be more forgiving to us? Yeah, so last year with Chapter 70, and that, that was the big one, we ended up with, we've been going up roughly about $40,000 a year in Chapter 70 money, additional $40,000, $50,000 a year. Last year we went up about $500,000 because we went from a minimum aid community to a, the next level, and I don't know the terminology there for the state, but that bumped it up about five hundred. What I don't know is, and I'm trying to get the answer to this, so now we go up 50,000 on top of that 500, or do we get like an extra three, 400 because we're in this new category? And hmm. it's, it's difficult to get an answer. Um, hmm. And we may not get an answer until the state, state numbers. Yeah, come. well, keep plugging because that's real money. Hmm. Do the best you can. So. And then uh, just the last announcement is the Veterans. Sure. Veterans Day, uh, there's a number of events uh, for Veterans Day. November 7th at 9 a.m., uh, Friends of Westport Council on Aging. Uh, there'll be a veterans breakfast. Uh, this is already close to capacity, according to Carol. On Thursday the 9th, they'll be at the Westport School for some ceremonies. Uh, 8 to 9.30 at the Westport Elementary. Uh, they'll uh, greet students as they arrive. They have a ceremony at the flagpole and they visit the different classrooms. 10 to 10.30, Westport Middle School. Uh, similar type um, program. They'll be in the auditorium with fifth through eighth grade students. Um, the veterans will, they can register and be, participate in this event. 11, 11.30 at the Macumba School for similar ceremony. And then on Saturday, November 11th at 10 o'clock, a Veterans Day ceremony at the uh, Beach Grove Cemetery. And weather, if it's bad weather, they'll be at the uh, Middle High School Gym. Looks uh, like the weather's going to cooperate. So. Yeah, looks good. And like always, Cavill's done a great job working with the veterans, and the veterans have helped to put this ceremonies together. That's all I have. Regarding Veterans Day, and, and uh, the Westport Elementary School principal invited me to that, but I'm going to be out of town. And that, I, I haven't gone to that in the past, and I don't even know if we were invited, but uh, if somebody can do that, that would be great, but I don't think it's critical. I, and I'll be at the cemetery on Saturday to make some remarks, like I usually do. Thank you. Any questions for Jim on his report? Okay. Moving along. Approval of minutes, and it looks like we have just one, uh, October 23rd, 2023. Manny or Paula, or whoever makes a motion here. Or can make a motion? We'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion made and seconded to approve those minutes. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. That motion carries. Next item is report on the bill warrant, but Ian is not here, so we'll have to. Get her to yeah, double down next time. Next time. All right. The next is the uh, selectman liaison committee reports and suggestions for future agenda discussions. Shawnee, you want to go first here? Uh, I don't have anything. Okay. Uh, I just have two things. I, I already covered Diamond. No, I'm sorry. I already covered Veterans Day. Diamond uh, had their uh, groundbreaking ceremony on Friday, and uh, I went there. Uh, to attend on behalf of Westport, and I didn't realize it, but I looked at the list of guest speakers and they had my name on it. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, I rose to the occasion and came up with something, and I don't know if it was intelligible, but it was, it, it's a great, it was a great event, and it was very cold and windy, but uh, it's very exciting that, what's going on at Diamond, and um, I was happy to be there. I saw Senator Roderick's, I saw some, some of her own. Uh, you know, citizens and a couple of other people. They do a very, very nice job, and it was, it was great to be there. So they're off and running, and uh, we've got that covered in terms of our financials. So the uh, next stop on my tour is at the Bristol County 
Commissioner's Advisory Committee. I think I got all those words in there. So this is the time of the year when they do their budget for Bristol County. I received, and I gave it, corruptly gave it to Paula, uh, a package of like 75 pages. Uh, the, the one I was looking for the most is in there, like page 54. That was Bristol Aggie. And I gave the whole package, you know, the hard copy to Paula, and I gave the electronic copy to the Finance Committee in telling them where to go to find the Bristol County so you don't have to go through the 58 pages. That's going up quite a bit, like 14% after a 10% increase last year. So that, that hurts. And uh, now I don't know if I can get that down, but when we have our meeting, it's going to be a remote meeting on Thursday. I'm going to ask about that. And I'm sure there's a good explanation, but it's not sustainable. We can't keep having double-digit increases. But anyway, we'll do the best I can. And that, that's it for me. So, Steve? Um, bicycle's still plugging along. I, I touched base on it last time. It's still going forward. Uh, at Serped, Jim White and, uh, got a little bit of money to help uh, do some of their uh, planning for the future. I think he got like 34000 He's got a long way to go to catch up to recreation, but he's still out there plugging. Um, I think that's pretty much it for now. We've got infrastructure Wednesday and we got a cable Wednesday, so busy day this week. Busy, busy, yeah. Summer's yeah. over. Time to get back to work. Yeah, true. Manny? Um, yeah, we, they, I guess the planning board had that informational meeting at the library and zoning. So there was, there was a, a couple of people there. Um, one of the residents, which I had expected, um, this was going to happen, that put a new septic in and saying, you know, Sue was going to come by. I mean, this was actually a person that purchased the house and was required to do it. It wasn't a DNET system. Yet. So we had that, that little bit of a topic. But the one thing, and, and I talked to Jim after, after the meeting, is um, our consultant really didn't s stress as much of like, the serpent study that we have. So he's got to get it out to these people. And we're gonna, I'm going to get involved a little bit more in the next zoning meeting because we'll never get it by town meeting if we don't do a better job than what we just did. It really wasn't very well. But um, we'll, keep, we'll keep plugging at it. Good. Thank you, Manny. Okay, is that it? Thank you. Okay, the next item is comments and statements from the public. Any public members here have anything to say? Yeah, I just want to know that Any age Thank you. on the uh, playground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to once again call attention to the board and commission, uh, committees and commission's vacancy list. It's on the town website. It's on our agenda here tonight. And, we, you know, we still have a lot of vacancies. Uh, item number 12 is topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Jim or Paul, do we, I don't think we have any of those tonight. And we do not have executive session tonight, so therefore, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion made and second. And all in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. There you go. Thank you. All right. Thank you for being here tonight. We appreciate it.